couple of years ago, I reviewed Secrets of Blackmore, a documentary about Dave Arneson and the development of the Blackmore campaign leading up to the ultimately the first edition of original Dungeons and Dragons. Starting around the same time that that one did was The Dreams in Gary's Basement, a documentary focusing on the life of Gary Gygax. I've covered a couple of biographies of Gygax's life in the past on my blog, like Empire of the Imagination and Rise of the Dungeon Master, which is a, a graphic novel presentation of Gary's life. When Dreams in Gary's Basement went up for Kickstarter, I felt this was an appropriate documentary to back up as well, kind of get two sides of the, both sides of the, uh, of the, for lack of a better term, Arnes Arnesonian and Gygaxian view of things. And now I've received my visual, my physical copy and watch it, so it's time to give my thoughts. The Dreams in Gary's Basement ultimately covers the same ground as Empire of the Imagination, albeit over a relatively shortened period of time in terms of runtime. The documentary briefly goes over Gary's childhood before moving into the early wargaming scene and Gary's involvement there, and then on to the development of the Bronstein and the Gary's developments of the rules for Chainmail, particularly the additional fantasy rules and how that would feed into Blackmore and eventually Dungeons and Dragons. It also goes into the Bloom family. They're eventually taking over the company after Don Kay's death and, find, and the turmoil leading into the ambush at Sheridan Springs. Through all of this, we get some mention of Gary's exile to Los Angeles, though it isn't presented as such exactly, the divorce, and the falling out with Dave Arneson with the ensuing lawsuit over the Dungeons and Dragons rules. We also get a bit more involved discussion of the impact of the Dallas Egbert disappearance and the Satanic Panic and disastrous D&D episode of 60 Minutes. Like Empire of the Imagination, we don't get a lot of coverage or discussion of Gary's projects after his ouster and before Wizards of the Coast bought DSR, TSR and with it D&D. Now, what makes this film valuable to watch in addition to reading Empire of the Imagination is the interviews and video footage that we get. We get lots of wonderfully shot footage of Lake Geneva, including in the winter, showing the cold Great Lakes winters that would create the perfect incubator for the development of RPGs. When you've got a bunch of really cold winters where it's too cold to do everything, anything outside, staying hanging out inside in a heated basement playing miniature war games is a really good option. The Pacific Northwest has, or at least historically had, similar situation with equally cold rainy falls, winters, and early springs, so I can see why, say, Magic the Gathering and such sprung up over here as well and why we latched on to tabletop role-playing once that made it out here. In the documentary, we also get photos of some of the TSR D&D licensed products, some of which have pictures in Art and Arcana, but many we didn't get, like the Dungeons and Dragons tricycle, not to mention video footage of commercials, which you can't put in a book, like for the Dungeons and Dragons action figures. We also have clips of TV broadcasts from local news or smaller major regional news outlets, but not like big stuff for about D&D when people were trying to figure out what the hell this new craze is. We get snippets of news articles from around the same time, interview footage from William Deere, the, invest the private investigator hired for the Dallas Egbert case on late night talk shows, which made him look like a self-aggrandizing ass. That is, the footage at the time made him look like an ass. He did doesn't need help from the documentary to do that. We also get important clips of the 60 Minutes episode, which was a planned hit piece from the start, and we also have home movies and photographs from Gary's exile in Los Angeles. Weirdly, when talking about some of the poor spending decisions made under the Bloom's tenure at TSR, while we get, say, uh, the news article of the excavation of a sunken vessel in Lake Geneva, um, we just get a glimpse of the news article, whereas I know that there's news footage about this, the whole incident out there, because when SF Debris did a thing on the history of TSR, they were able to find a clip of local news coverage. I don't know if this is an instance where the documentary couldn't get the clearances and SF Debris being a video essay can operate on the territory of better to ask forgiveness than permission, but whatever. If I have a complaint about the film, it's that the film doesn't really get into that period of time where... Gary has gotten the blooms out, but
but before the ambush of, at Sheridan Springs, where it really comes across that Gary is not a business guy and he is basically running into similar problems with him being the mismanagement and him being the problem running TSR once he's regained control and ultimately his leading to Lorraine Williams resting control of the company and um, Gary losing control again, ultimately there through his own hubris. It is painted as Lorraine Williams running a power play in response to poor treatment and an admittedly misogynist flexing of muscle in front of TSR staff by Gary after he regained control. Also, the film repeats without question Frank Metker giving the apocryphal story that Jimi Hendrix experienced were kicked off the UC Berkeley campus by Lorraine Williams because she didn't like their cultural vibe and possibly because they were smoking weed. I, I can't, and lots of other people haven't been able to find any conclusive evidence that an incident happened. It would have been nice to have additionally as part of the story is where that came, narrative came from. If that was a story being told among the TSR employees who didn't like Lorraine, is that something that Lorraine's people in the company were spreading. Is it something Lorraine herself said? That would have been nice to know. And ultimately, it's discussion in of Gary's involvement in the game industry after TSR before the Watsi buyout begins and ends at Cyborg Commando without getting into TSR's lawsuits on anyone else who did business with them. I would have loved to have gotten some comments from people who worked at GDW at the time about the whole Dangerous Domains, Dangerous Journeys deal. Um, they do do a good job of getting across that um, Cyborg Commando from a game standpoint was no threat to TSR. It was mid at best and similar, same case for Dangerous Journeys, but we don't mention Dangerous Journeys at all. And Dangerous Journeys got an announced computer game for the Turbo Graphics. So there's that. In short, this is a good presentation for an important part of the Gygax story, but it's not really a complete version. You really still need something like Designers and Dragons to get that important chapter of the history of after Gary's out at TSR, but before things fences are mended with Wizards of the Coast after Wizards buys TSR. We don't get much. We have a little bit of the New Infinities productions, but not like the GDW uh, Dangerous Journey side of things. Um, and while, to be honest, also we don't get much of a perspective of what the outside industry viewed of Gary. Uh, we don't get much sense of his interactions with people from outside of TSR. Um, not while he's at TSR, and certainly not after he's out and thus kind of starting his own company or working with other companies like again, like GDW. We don't get any commentary from Lauren Wiseman about working with Gary to get Dangerous Journeys published or any commentary with him from Mayfair Games about reaching out to Gary for um, having him contribute to the City State of the Invincible Overlord box set. N nothing like that. Some of the people in this documentary would have been around for that part of the history and could have commented about it, but we don't think we necessarily got that in the interviews that we see in there. There may be more in the larger footage, but it's not on the disc. And if they didn't get, get to talk about that during the documentary, some of them have been have passed since then, and we won't be able to interview them now. Um, and again, like bring up Lauren Weisman, Lauren Weisman, I, he's passed. We can't get an interview with him to talk about, uh, times at it's kind of, a, though that, that aspect of not getting that larger story is kind of a bummer. Actually, I, I think Lauren Weisman might've actually already passed by the time they started production. Um, I'm not, for sh not sure, but still being able to talk to talk with other people at GW or in the larger industry about Gary, um, what their interactions with him were like in terms of, like, we had some people like more recent people, but like when Gary was trying to, was active as a designer um, through the new Infinity's Productions period, through 
the dangerous journeys period, just that whole period of time. Like have talking to Steve Jackson, um, he, to get Gary's, it's Steve, like did Steve and Gary meet and discuss, um, particularly considering the context of as a fan of Knights of the Journey magazine, one of the major characters in the comic, Gary Jackson is a deliberate combination of Steve and Gary and their names. But like just having some of that, that conversation and the discussion there would be great. Um, if Gary was a really divisive figure among larger people in the industry um, and how they reacted to him and how they interacted with him, that would be great to have in terms of um, when Gary was at TSR, or once Gary was ousted, um, all that sort of stuff. Do I recommend this documentary? Absolutely. If you are interested in role-playing history, you need to have this in your collection alongside Secrets of Blackmore. Secrets of Blackmore does a really good job of elaborating on the concepts that led to the creation of the Bronstein um, and how Dave Arneson as a person fit into that, into these social groups and how that led ultimately motivated him and led him to taking the uh, chainmail rules, running the Blackmore game, and that in turn feeding into Dungeons and Dragons. And once they Dave got to collaborate with Gary. Honestly, um, I do hope that both of these documentaries, and for that matter, uh, Eye of the Beholder and the Dwarven Knot, get picked up by, like, say, Canopy or Hoopla, one of these streaming services that focus their attention on libraries because and like as a place to platform in addition to old films and tele foreign films and television and that sort of thing but documentary material because this is this is the good stuff this is something that is really good to have as an educational standpoint for helping to convey more about the history of tabletop role playing role playing and as a biography of gary in general um in particular is this the ultimate documentary about world playing that I want? No, what I really want, I'll tell you what I want, what I really, really want. What I want is like the Ken Burns document, Ken Burns equivalent of a documentary adaptation of Designers and Dragons with a bunch of playing at the world and the elusive shift all thrown in there. Um, I want Shannon Applecline and John Peterson and all of them um, working together to create a documentary to, to as serving as like the foundation point of a documentary, the way Shelby foot was in Ken Burns civil war and having them and, and having that story be told over five nights in two hour episodes, each on public broadcasting. That's what I really want. But until we get that, getting these piecemeal person portions of the story, like the dreams in Gary's basement is what we got and I'll take what I can get. And if you do want to get it again, it's available for streaming and digital purchase uh, at rpghistory.net. That's currently the only documentary they have there at the moment. I would love to see some of these other um, RPG documentarians like the director, like the creators of secrets of Blackmore, like the creators of the Dwarven knot, like the creators of eye of the beholder, work together to have a have a place where you can go to to get all these rpg history documentaries and thus helping to serve as a platform for when other people want to tell similar documentaries they can do so like in terms of they can say okay we're making this documentary and i know that we have a platform here at rpghistory.net once it's done for it to go up there that would be wonderful in the meantime check out this documentary um i'll have a link in the doobly-doo to rpghistory.net where you can get it. It's not an affiliate link, it's just a place where you can get the documentary. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe, and also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early, 
of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider packing my coffee. Uh, Tossing me a few bucks also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that. 